Welcome to Wining and Dining with Jim White. It's the program devoted to introducing you to the men and women who create the flavors you love. We're delighted to have with us today uh, some of the flavors that you I uh, love the most, especially around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Austin area, and Houston area, Uchi. And Chef uh, Alex Estrante is going to be with us on the program. Hey, Chef, welcome. Oh, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here, so... Uh, Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, somebody who knows a little bit about Italian uh, food and uh, travel and cheese, our guest gourmet, the lovely Paula Lambert. How are you, my dear? Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm so glad, especially to have you here with us uh, all through the month as our guest gourmet on Wining and Dining with Jim White. Now, your entire business is based on Italy. So uh, what what would you like to add here at the top of the show uh, about... Uh, Maybe one of your trips, you take people on these wonderful trips. I do. I take people to Tuscany and also to Puglia. And lots of people don't know where Puglia is. It's the heel of the boot. And it's just a wonderful part of Italy. They have so many fantastic vegetables. And when you have a first course down there, they might bring you 12 different vegetables for the first course. And their wines are delicious. And they have unusual architecture and it's a great place to go i'm taking people there on october 19th wow now paula uh i know your trips really fill up quickly but is there still room yes just call me call paula well what's the phone number paula 214-741-4072 we might even get technically lucky and put that up on the screen but uh, you can always go to uh uh, mozco.com right that's right get more information slash travel ah there you go well uh chef uh, alex uh, and i were uh, uh, chef alex paula and i were wondering what's a good italian boy from uh, around milan doing cooking asian food uh that's a question that actually uh, i get pretty often <laughs> uh, <laughs> funny or no uh I don't know. I mean, I just I just kind of fell into it. I had a good friend of mine that um, used to work for Uchi in Houston, and he kept talking about how great he was and how awesome the experience to work in that company and, and their culture. So I just decided to go try it and check it out, and I fell in love with it. And then been there for three and a half years now. So yeah, uh, it's been it's been a fun ride so far. So uh, yeah, it definitely was right. Part of the opening team at at Uchi. Uh, how did you and uh, Tyson Cole happen to hook up for this opportunity? Uh, I mean, Tyson is is very uh, you know is somebody that you know like for how well known it is, and it's very reachable. So like we you know we talk often, and also like he comes to the restaurant like on a regular basis. So um, yeah, but it's very it, it, cool guy, cool guy to know, um, and cool cool guy to kind of like learn from. So. Well, what was the, what was the situation? What I'm saying is, back at the very beginning, how did you get involved in that opening team? Uh, what were you doing that led to that, and so forth? So, I was working for uh, I was working for Stephen Powell um, at that time, and I kind of like you know, I, I kind of wanted like a, a little bit of a change. So, my friend like um, called me and told me if I wanted to go and and, and stage and, and do a tasting. So I went down uh, to do that kind of process, uh, interview process with a with a tasting. Um, they kind of like, I guess they, they like my personality. They also like the food I presented. And, and so after a couple of weeks, they offered me a position there. And I went down to Houston for about two and a half months before we opened Uchi Dallas to kind of train and, and kind of learn the ways, the Uchi's way, learn like, you know, how to um, create their food because they have a very unique, we have a very unique way of creating dishes. So um, I was training down there and then I came up for uh, Uchi Dallas opening. Like what you were doing at San Salvaje too. So, but I'm, I'm yeah. It's a nice transition. It was. Uh, I love. I love that restaurant too. Uh, definitely, like it was a very special uh, place uh, and point in my career because it was my first like executive chef position. And Stephen was, um, you know, so grateful to actually allow me and give me that opportunity. Um, I missed it. Uh, it was a great restaurant. I think it, it, it went. You know, I think it just uh, it disappeared too soon. Um, so, all right. Now, I uh, identified you as being uh, from a village in Italy near Milan, but what is your actual hometown? Uh, my hometown is called uh, Pietra de Giorgi, which is about like 45 minutes southwest of Milan. Uh, very small, up in the uh, 
up in the hills in the uh, it's called the area is called Ultra Papavese. Um, so yeah, it's very very small town. And Paula, have have you conducted any tours around? Uh, you know. Well, I I was Milan. there this year. I went on a, the most wonderful tour of the region of Italy of the Piedmont and of the area around Parma. And uh, we went to cheese factories and prosciutto factories, all in that region. It's gorgeous up in those hills, Alex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wish I was going with you on a trip, too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all go. Let's go with Paula. Do you have, uh, are you able to incorporate any uh, Italian flavors or ingredients or anything like that in the Asian dishes that you're it, doing at Uchi? It's, uh, it's a tricky, it's a little tricky. Uh, I try to. Uh, it's kind of like one of those things that, we had to kind of like we have our like you know like um, parameters in a sense of like what we can do. Um, we don't really want to get too away from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I try to once in a while to kind of like whether it's like you know like um, try to do um, just a little cheesier in there. Or um, lately, we just had a tasting a few days ago, and I kind of like put together like a carpaccio dish, but you know we kind of Asian flavor. So, you know, yes, I try to incorporate some of my my backgrounds, a little bit of my my roots into it. Um, obviously, with, uh, you know, a twist on it, but yeah. So we're not gonna find any la- lasagna rolls with brown rice or <laughs> No, no, I don't think that's gonna have it happen, but um, I might try, not necessarily is gonna make it to the menu, but. <laughs> that's great. Now, is there, um, each of these restaurants, I'm sure, uh, has a very distinctive personality. I've been in Austin. I've met Tyson, but I haven't been to actually. I haven't been to Uchi in Austin or Houston. Uh, what's the difference between those restaurants and the Dallas location? Well, it's mainly like I mean, we, we like I say, we execute like you know our kind of like the Uchi vision and kind of like those flavors. However, um, every restaurant has you know a, a chef de cuisine and a team behind behind them so like it's a vision uh, of course it's like a, you know it has to be approved like we do tastings um pretty much on a quarterly basis for our core menu and also we do a special tasting every month and so it's a vision that is it comes together um from the chef team and also like uh, our cooks um which is that's one of the things i i love about our culture is and the way we do things because we allow our cooks to create dishes and those dishes like after like a, a, a process and developing and, and tasting they actually end in they, they actually end up on a special page which is you know it, it's pretty awesome for a cook um, to be able to have their dishes on the menu which you know I never had opportunity uh, until I was a chef because that's what you do like right you work for somebody and you execute their vision their dishes and, and the recipes like here we have that opportunity to create our own little menu which is a special page on a monthly basis and it's created by us and the cook so um, yeah that's fun that's interesting and it's such a beautiful location and uh, now for folks who haven't been by in a while upstairs is now uchiba which yep. which i guess is uh, the combination of the words uh, house and bar uh, pretty much yes okay uh uchiba is it's is our newest concept upstairs um is it's a a, a version of kind of like Uchi, but much uh, a little more casual uh, in a sense. Uh, we kind of offer some of the you know like staple dishes that we do downstairs. We also have a, a smaller sushi bar. Um, the biggest is difference we have like a full bar which we don't have a Uchi, um, and also like we have like uh, a yakitori grill where we do kind of like dishes off you know skewers, kind of like a little more like a street food like kind of fare in a sense and. Um, yeah, it's very fun. Uh, different kind of energy, different kind of ambience, but um, it definitely it's it's a it's a place to to check out. So if you haven't if you haven't been, please definitely come in and see us there. Um, it's fun. Food is delicious. So, did you ever hear the phrase that was uh, recited so often, probably not for the last twenty five or thirty years, but uh, the original thought in Texas about sushi? Did you ever hear what people used to say about, "I'm not eating that. That's bait." But I'm so glad that uh, any last strange, misguided notions of that have been put to rest thanks to wonderful cuisines like yours at at Uchi. Well, there's also the availability of wonderful product. The fish that you buy is of the highest quality. And years ago, it might not have been here. 
It's true. It might have been bait that they were trying to pass <laughs> off as <it's, laughs> uh, sushi. <laughs> yeah, that's probably also a reason. But uh, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of more uh, channels and a lot of more like kind of like um, you know like purveyors and and things that you can get great fish nowadays anywhere. So. What kind of a learning curve did you have? Uh, a guy from Italy, and you're doing a Latin cuisine with Stephen Piles, and then you come into a predominantly Asian restaurant. What What was that like for you? That transition? Uh, it's been great. I mean, honestly, um, when I got here, uh, I didn't know anything about Latin or anything about Southwestern or Japanese cuisine at all. Um, so I felt like those experiences uh, they kind of like build my own. Uh, style and my own kind of like way I create flavors. So uh, all of those experiences have definitely been very impactful and, and very uh, beneficial for my growth. So, Who put your love for cooking into you? Where, where did that come from? Where did that all start? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that this is a common thing, but definitely it's my mom and grandmother. Um, I always, being around the table, um, the earliest memory I have, it was just like being under the table, like, you know, like stealing like, fresh gnocchi as my mom was making them. So like, those are my first childhood child, childhood memories and that's where it all started, so. Yeah. Did, did you cook with them? Yeah, I mean, as a little bit. I mean, I didn't really do much, but uh, whatever they needed me to do, I, I, I help and they let me mess around with things a little bit here and there, so yeah. Did you find yourself kind of standing back and watching and kind of being interested in their preparations? Yeah, and yeah for sure, uh, definitely like, you know, like just, even nowadays is like watching it's is one of the the good things to do um you can learn a lot from just watching that's interesting and where did you get your training beyond mama uh, and grandmama yeah. so i decided to go um to culinary school later in life because i and it's one of the the advices that i give to young cooks nowadays is because you want to first like just get out there and work a couple of years to see what you're really getting yourself into it um, because it's not as, as glamorous as it might seem on TV. Um, and so I, I worked for a while and then I decided to get my uh, culinary degree at El Centro uh, here in Dallas when I, when I moved here. Um, it was very beneficial at that time in my life and, and, and a very good learning experience. And the program there is great. It's you know, definitely like a much more affordable compared to like some of those fancy and like, you know, like culinary school you found out there, but the foundation and, and, and the structure were great. And so I have nothing but good memories there. It is a great program. Some of the top chefs around have, have been through that program. Lots. Yeah. I know. I think of Mark Castle and Janice Prevost. I mean, there's so many that went to uh, El Centro. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. All, all great. But anybody, uh, anybody on the contemporary scene that was kind of in the class with, with you when you were at El Centro that you can think of? In my class, um, I mean, I had a friend that was in my class. His name was Steven, and he worked at, um, uh, at the Hyatt Hotel for a while. Now he's just actually moved to uh, mm-hmm. Singapore, but he's, he's doing great things there. So, um, yeah. Sharon Hage. Yeah. Lots of great people. Uh, Jody Denton, he's a corporate Oh, I now, love him. He was I big s- in San Francisco for many years. Yes, uh, I see him at the Fancy Food Show. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, it, it's a wonderful training program. And, and folks, we can't laud uh, El Centro's food and hospitality program uh, any stronger, uh, and especially if you're listening or watching and have children who uh, want to become chefs and get into the business. It's a great way to get uh, Practical application and classical training as well too, and it doesn't cost you thirty or forty or fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year to do it. <laughs> well, you've got a, a, a rather uh, important interest away from the uh, restaurant in that uh, little man Luca. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, being a father and having a family and working at a a busy, sophisticated, modern metropolitan restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Luca, it's, uh, it's right now, like, uh, it's our kind of like, you know, like joy of our life. My wife and I would definitely like uh, love him and it's been an, uh, an amazing addition to the family. It's, it's hard to balance like uh, work life, uh, you know, with such a busy restaurant. And now that I kind of oversee uh, both concepts here in Dallas, it, it, it makes it a little harder. However, um, same thing I preach to my staff is as like the quality of life. It's it's super important. So um, my wife and I we kind of worked out our own schedule where uh, we have like you know a good part of the mornings and then you know obviously like 
that they all fight together um when we hang out as a family and we kind of like make a strong effort to um to be a family and 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 kind of like stay together um but yeah so it is definitely like it keeps me busy uh you know i feel like work never stop like you know between the restaurant and i go home is actually like you know to all moms out there uh i feel like being a mom is probably even more more like like hard than just you know working 80 hours a week to be honest well who handles the family meals at home um my wife uh she definitely like in the past few years she she kind of like learned uh how to cook and and much more than she used to so she definitely like spends more time like you know than i do at home in the kitchen sometimes i you know like sometimes like i felt like the the most people think that you know chefs they go home and like they have these making those wonderful meals all the time it's like sometimes all we want is just like a simple like simple simple thing like you know even just like a toast with like two slices of bread with a piece of cheese in the middle that's all we want it's like a piece of mozzarella company cheese. Yeah, of course. <laughs> sure, yes. Uh, Put that right in the middle. Yeah. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Uh, do you think uh, you would be encouraging Luca to follow in your footsteps in the culinary world? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I uh, kind of like I kind of like want to leave it up to him. He definitely looks up to to that. And when I go in the kitchen, he wants to help, and 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 he's great. He just wants to like you know do his little things and. Um, but no, I mean, I don't know. I just like I let him be and let him decide whatever he decided uh, when he grows up. But, but yeah, so if he wants to do it, great. I'd be more than you know excited to you know teach him and and even you know mentor him through certain things. But yeah, it's up to him. Well, uh, if he takes after you, he'll certainly have the look. So he could definitely be a Food Network star <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Let me ask you this: Any uh, special events coming up uh, in the fall uh, at Uchi? Um, we we do a lot of things like in terms of like, besides like you know like the the typical thing that you find around town like you know like we get invited to events and things like that. Um, we tend we try to do like uh, some in house like uh, events, which is whether it's like um, you know sushi classes in in the private dining room, which you have like a full meal, but you also have like um, ends on um, uh, practice with sushi or whatever it is. We do like um, special dinners for um, uh, kind of like new di- new dishes that come on the menu uh, right before we release them uh, to the to every to the public. We have like typically like a 20, 20 to twenty to twenty four people come in and join us and and just try those. Um, we are doing a, a beer dinner. With uh, Itachino uh, Auchiba, actually the dinner will be uh, in October, um, so that'll be a fun one. Um, but yeah, so we do a lot of things throughout the year. Um, if you look us uh, on our Instagram account, like uh, we definitely like see what we we promote and what we kind of like try to do and okay. keep things there. Pretty active Facebook page too and yeah. website. Yeah, you can yeah. get it all right Absolutely. there. Yeah. So come and see uh, Alex Estranti at Uchi and Uchi Ba because you oversee both of the culinary operations there. And uh, thank you for bringing uh, such uh, good spirit and good food to the Dallas-Fort Worth dining scene. Glad to have you on the show today. Yeah, no, it was, it was great to be here. And, uh, um, yeah, hopefully we keep, like, pushing the envelope and making the Dallas food scene even better. All right. Well, it's time for another episode of Vicki Uncorked. Let's see what Vicki Briley White has to share with us. Well, we met up with Bob Levy of Harland Estate, and he's going to tell you about his journey. So my journey is kind of interesting. It's pretty unusual for, um, I, I think, by most standards. I, when I was 17 years old, I was introduced to wine by a brother-in-law who, who was a wine collector and aficionado for wine. And I knew at that point in time that... Um, that wine was always going to be a part of my life. I didn't know that I was going to go into wine growing or production or, or vineyard end, but um, uh, I, I just knew I had, you know, so much passion for it that it was going to always be a part of my life. And I had this uh, preconceived sort of self-imposed expectation that I was going to go into medicine because of our family history. Yeah. And, um, and so that's the path I chose and went, ended up going to school at UC Davis, which um, um, was a, you know, one of the top UC, University of California 
campuses. It was fairly small back then, um, but obviously it also had a winemaking and viticulture department, which wasn't really the reason I chose it, but um, yes, it, was, it, it, it was convenient. <laughs> it was convenient that it was there. <laughs> and, um, and so, of course, I took the introductory courses, I, and I joined a bunch of um, uh, tasting groups in Davis and also over in Napa Valley, which is only about an hour away. And, and uh, you know, after a couple of years of, of doing that and still thinking I'm going down the pathway of medicine, um, I really kind of had an epiphany. I had to, I had to declare a major because I, I entered as undeclared, but, but with uh, the understanding that I was pre-med. And um, the epiphany sort of happened in Napa Valley where I realized a couple of important things. One was that I had so much passion for wine, I knew I'd never get tired of it. You know, you, you say they say that if you're passionate about what you do, it never seems like work. Well, that sort of really hit me. I also realized that uh, I'd be able to live in this rural, rural environment where this this happened, and that just struck me as just the best place on earth to be to be living, rather than some metropolitan area, which is where I probably would have ended up in, in medicine. So. That was that set the path for me, and I never looked back. The first job I had out of Davis was um, was at Cuvesson. Worked under Philip Tony. Then I worked about five harvests there, and then then went on to um, to build uh, and run the operation for Kerner Rombauer, Rombauer Vineyards, when it started in the early 80s. Um, the end of 1981 was when I moved in there. And um, in '83, I met Bill Harlan. Uh, who brought a project that he was just starting to Rombauer Vineyards because he didn't have a facility to make the wine. And that, that project uh, was called Maryvale at the time. Um, and I'd, I'd, I've now worked with Bill for over 35 years Wow! in uh, all the projects that, that, uh, that have come his way and our way. And, and um, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great thing. So some of those projects uh, were Obviously, Harlan Estate, Bond Estates. There's the newest one, which is Promontory, and then there was a uh, a private wine club called Napa Valley Reserve. So I still oversee all all four of those those operations as director of wine growing. But along the way, wanted to have um, always wanted to have a project of 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 my own. And when I met Martha, we worked on it together. Martha McClellan, which is my wife and, and business partner, and um, namesake in, in our brand, Levy and McClellan. And we had developed through the 80s, actually an interesting thing, because when I learned winemaking at Davis, it was the end of an era of, of the, the, the professors who were there who were teaching um, the winemakers of, of the time how to solve problems. And, and there were many problems in the wine industry mm -hmm. um, post-prohibition. A lot of wines that were, were produced were, were fortified dessert wines, so there was, there was very, very uh, lackadaisical sort of sanitary practices and, and other, other sorts of things that, that just kind of um, took shape because it didn't matter so much with the high alcohol, they were, the wines were protected from microbiological instability and things like that. So when the, when the switch went back, to more table wines, still wines, um, in the late 50s and into the 60s, there were a lot of issues. And so Davis was still trying to teach the industry how to solve those problems and make correct wines. And that's what I, the era that I learned under. Um, and then, you know, I kind of look at it in the sense that these wines were technically correct and they were sound, but they didn't really have the interest that, that mm -hmm. wines today have. And so, we had to we had to create a methodology where whereby we could maintain this correctness this soundness but make wines of more interest and more character and show sense of place and so when i when i met uh philip tony we were working he was working with um uh hillside cabernets mostly and that mm -hmm. that became my my passion and, and my my focus and direction and that's what it's been for for my career um and i loved about those the the, the power and the concentration in the wines, um, and even more importantly, the sense of where they're grown, the uniqueness of one site different from another. 
Um, the challenge was that with the old school techniques of viticulture and the old school vinification techniques, the tannins were often less than desirable. They were often very rustic and very mm -hmm. dry and very difficult to find pleasurable. And so that became my, my you know, focus in, in how, do, how do we make these wines with this concentration and this sense of place with softer tannins. And had a lot of ideas in, in working with existing um, vineyards and, ex and, and convert changing vinification techniques to make improvements on that. Um, but when it came time to do our own project, I had some other ideas um, that we wanted to try um, to really uh, raise the grapes, raise the vines in a way that we had an even better chance of getting soft tannins. And some of those things had to do with uh, closer spacing, uh, irrigating the vineyards early on in, when the vines were young to drive the root system down very deeply with the intent that by the time the vines are 10 years old, we wanted to have them dry farmed. We wanted to be mm -hmm. able to not have to irrigate at all. In order to do that, we had to make those roots go down deep as quickly as possible. Um, those, are, those are some of the things. I mean, I, I, there literally are um, dozens and dozens of axioms and, and, and principles that I've applied and, and we've worked on together to um, to, uh, uh, to lead us in the direction of softer tannins with a good sense of place and good concentration. Um, but that's what it's all about for Levy and McClellan. When I was researching some of the things with you, it struck me by some of the things that you had said that for you, making a bottle of wine is like art. And that you want, well, I'll let you tell me what you want. <laughs> Well, well, I, th you know, this is one of the things about about being a wine producer, a wine grower, is that we're we're making a product that other people hopefully will enjoy, and will bring mm -hmm. pleasure to them. And if we can, if we can bring um, to them the op an opportunity that uh, even one time, one bottle, one occasion, um, really elevates their sense of enjoyment um, to to almost an ethereal level. Um, then that's that's where the art comes in. You know, there art comes in many in many forms, and right. and um, and different people respond and react to to pieces of art in different ways. But it just um, it's just such a sense sense of accomplishment and 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 uh, a, being able to elevate the spirit of, of somebody just by, by virtue of ex experiencing a wine. Um, well, know, do, you think, do you think that uh, your approach to that, because you're so focused on the, the details, the, the wine, uh, you know, the, the terroir, you know, all of this working together and creating the best thing you can out of what you get, because you've gone into an area that um, you're not producing mass amounts of wine. No, very and, small, yeah. And so you, you've kind of chosen the more artistic way. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, to say that, that, you know, one person is, is an artist and another is not is not really what I'm trying to say. I think we have different approaches, uh, and everybody, everybody has a different opinion about what they feel is the is right way to make wine or exactly. the right way to bring Dr the expression of that. Or to drink wine or, or buy to drink wine. wine yes. All those things. It's very subjective, obviously. Um, but I, I'm, I'm only saying that, um, you know, if we, if we hit that, that note for one person one time, it, that just makes it all worthwhile for me. That's great. Thanks, Vicki. Paula, I just, uh, I'm so pleased to have you here with us. Uh, we've gotten two shows done and uh, another one coming. And I appreciate uh, your taking so much of your valuable time and being with us as our guest gourmet this month. It's my great pleasure. I just love it. And it's so great to be here with you and with Alex. Yeah, Alex Estrante joining us on the show. Folks, uh, remember, if anybody asks you what you're making for dinner, tell them reservations at Uchi. Uchi.